Hi guys. A few notes before we start. First, I made a small factual error in my previous video. Clyde Tombaugh checking for planets at the opposition point wasn't because the objects would be moving in retrograde. It was because they wouldn't appear to be moving at all. It wasn't motion that determined distance, but simple parallax measurements. Didn't catch that until I started research for the next episode. Speaking of, you may have noticed that this isn't the next episode in the Planet X series. That isn't because I haven't started it. In fact, I'm pretty far along on it. It's just that, unlike my previous entries in the series, which deal with science that has been largely settled, the next video will deal with issues that are still unresolved today. And, not being a scientist, I don't feel comfortable making claims about them without a little more research. But I'm also due to take a late Christmas holiday to visit family overseas and didn't want to leave you with nothing. That's when I remembered I had this old script lying around and figured there was no time like the present to show it to you. It's not completely unrelated to the topic at hand. In fact, you might think of it as a very distant prequel, the parent of a much longer story that I may complete after this series is done. So, with no further ado, let's mark X on the map and go looking for planets. No son zesfenu, me de no lo silipu, prosoligon estitosen, totelos o chronos apenti. In order to fully explore the story of the planets, we must first determine what the word planet was originally meant to define. As with many things, our Western civilization took its understanding of the planets from the ancient Greeks. To them, the denizens of the sky comprised the sun and moon, the fixed stars, asteris aplanis, which remain motionless relative to one another, and the five wandering stars, asteris planetae, which moved against the background of the fixed stars. Note that I said five wandering stars. The sun and moon weren't incorporated until later, and only served to obscure what the word planet meant to its original creators. Understanding what it meant to these earliest Greeks demands that we divorce ourselves from our modern vision of planets as living worlds of sand, wind, and storms flying through the void, and reduce them in our minds to single, unknowable points, brighter and perhaps odder than the surrounding stars, but otherwise indistinguishable. And of course, we must remove our own world from their midst as the Greeks believed in an Earth-centered universe. To the Greeks, and indeed to all ancient civilizations, the wandering stars were just that, stars that moved. The discovery that some stars apparently possess independent motion is one of the earliest scientific observations made by any civilization. And civilization is key. This is not a finding that could easily be made by unsettled, nomadic people as it requires multiple observations from a fixed position over the course of several days, carefully marking out the minute movements as they occur, and also a class of people with the free time, specialist skill, and accumulated knowledge to conduct the observations. Astronomers. This might explain why the planets, despite their many mythic associations, do not appear in creation stories. The discovery of the planets led almost inevitably to an attempt to grasp their meaning and purpose. After all, the other elements of the sky had a clear use. The sun and clouds brought light to sea and rain for crops. The moon gave light at night and marked the passing of time, while the rising of the fixed stars marked important times of the year, such as harvest or the flooding of the Nile, and also aided in navigation. But what did these strange, seemingly useless lights represent? What powers did they possess? And what gifts did they bestow? Why did they, alone among all the wonders of the sky, follow their own unique paths? Obviously, they must have had some purpose for the gods to have gone to the trouble of placing them there, but what that purpose was was left for us to decipher, and the attempts to do so led to what we now call astrology. Most civilizations have some knowledge of planetary motion, though the extent and complexity of this knowledge varied widely. The Greeks' knowledge of the planets was arguably the most comprehensive and detailed of any pre-telescope society, but they didn't need it from whole cloth. And just as we owe our knowledge of the planets to the Greeks, so they owed theirs to the Babylonians. The Babylonians were an early Mesopotamian culture that grew out of the city of Babylon in what is now Iraq. Their period of influence lasted roughly from 1800 BC to 300 BC, and it is from them that the first historical reference to the motions of the planets appeared. 
The history of the region is a long chain of invasions and conquests by various assorted cultures, from Akkadians and Assyrians to Persians and Greeks. But through all this, there flowed a strong continuity of tradition, as new empires copied and preserved records from their predecessors, with century piling on century, culture piling on culture, all the way back to the earliest civilization, the Sumerians. The Sumerians were the first large-scale civilization ever to exist, and, perhaps more importantly, also the first to invent writing. Their writing system is known as cuneiform, or wedge-shaped, because it was made by pressing wedge-like marks into wet clay with a metal stylus. This, to us, unconventional mode of transmission has meant that vast numbers of their clay, quote, books have survived to the present day, long after less durable materials like paper would have disintegrated. The Sumerian language was an isolate. It had no known ancestors and left no descendants. But subsequent civilizations like the Babylonians adapted cuneiform to their own languages, preserving the Sumerian literature and supplementing it with their own. As the heirs to the inventors of the written word, the Babylonians elevated writing to an almost divine status. To them, the night sky itself was the conscious inscription of a deity, one that, if it could be read, would reveal the fates of kingdoms. Fate was the overriding preoccupation of these early Babylonian astronomers. The Anuma Anu Enlil was not only the first known mathematical astronomical compendium, but also a foundational astrological text. It comprises 70 cuneiform tablets listing nearly 7,000 omens of national significance, political, agricultural, and military. Its oldest section, and the oldest known record of planetary motion, is the so-called Venus Tablet of Amasaduka, a list of the observed motions of the planet Venus believed to have been compiled during the reign of the king Amasaduka of Babylon's first dynasty in the 16th century BC. But by far the greatest corpus of astronomical data preserved from the Babylonian era are the so-called astronomical diaries, a series of systematic observations of the motions of the sun, moon, planets, and stars that were kept over a period of 600 years, from about 650 to 60 BC, a time span longer than modern science has existed. Along with these data, the diaries also included references to various events of national import, war, famine, disease, river levels, deaths and assassinations of kings, and even monstrous births. It is clear that these records were astrological rather than astronomical, intended to aid in determining omens, messages from the gods written in the cosmos that linked the chaos of human life to the predictable cycles of the sky. These records arguably represent the first mathematical observations of the natural world to determine underlying causations. However, it would be a mistake to describe these diaries as scientific, as they lack both the mathematical rigor to distinguish true correlation from coincidence and any form of underlying predictive theory apart from divine will. The Babylonians nonetheless viewed the interpretation of divine will as immensely practical, as they considered omens to be warnings, not judgments, warnings which could be undone, or loosened, as they put it, through the use of ritual magic. Divine will mattered to the Babylonians because they viewed their gods as capricious and cruel, and even a cursory examination of the weather reports in the diaries will explain why. Far from the arid conditions of today, ancient Mesopotamian weather was a miserable maelstrom of hail, thunder, fog, and mist. It's not surprising, therefore, that the Babylonians sought some degree of control over their surroundings, and turned to mysticism as the only means available. The Babylonians saw their gods in the sky. They divided the field of stars into three belts, the Way of Anu, god of the sky. Way of Enlil, god of the wind, and Way of Ea, god of water. The five planets, which the Babylonians called Bibu, or stray sheep, move within these ways, and their motions determine the god's will. At around this time, to the west, a younger civilization was emerging from a dark age, carrying with it the seeds of the modern world. Precisely why the ancient Greeks were the first civilization to embrace what we now call science is unknown, but we do know where and when it began. On the coast of what is now Turkey, in a city called Miletus, in the 6th century BC. There, a group of philosophers we now call the Milesian School taught that, rather than divine will, it was necessity that governed all things. Things happened because they had to, not because some god arbitrarily willed it. This new philosophy of naturalism would be applied to their conceptions of how the world functioned and formed. Chief among them was a man named Thales, whom Carl Sagan would declare the first scientist. Thales was said to have predicted an eclipse, 
and to have used his scientific knowledge to guide his business ventures, such as investing in olive presses after determining that the year would bring a good harvest. According to Aristotle, Thales believed that the world formed from water, and that water was, quote, that from which is everything that exists, and from which it first becomes and into which it is rendered at last, and is the element and principle of things that are. The idea that the universe formed from water is not intrinsically different from the creation account in Genesis. The difference is that in Thales's universe, there is no god to call for light. This call for naturalistic explanations would be passed down to Greek philosophers for centuries to come. In the first century AD, the Greek philosopher Theon of Smyrna would proclaim the Greeks superior to the Babylonians or Egyptians, as those cultures did not possess physiologia, or natural philosophy, a term that 2,000 years later would be replaced with the word science. That said, for all his accomplishments, Thales knew nothing of the planets. A century later, Plato would claim that the Greeks knew only of one planet, Venus, and gained their knowledge of the planets from barbarians. Incidentally, the word barbarian is ancient Greek for anyone who wasn't ancient Greek, and included great civilizations like the Babylonians. Though, curiously, Plato and Greek chroniclers generally credit the Egyptians with having given Greece this knowledge, despite the fact that there is little to no evidence that the Egyptians possessed a comprehensive theory of planetary motion before the arrival of Greek culture under Alexander. Conversely, when one looks at Babylonian astronomy, it's difficult not to see it as anything but the prototype for the Greek. The Babylonians gave each of the planets the name of one of their gods. The planet the Greeks called Zeus, and we called Jupiter, the Babylonians named after their ruling god, Marduk. The one the Greeks called Aphrodite, and we call Venus, they named for their goddess of love, Ishtar. The one the Greeks called Ares, and we call Mars, they named after their god of war, Nergal. The Babylonians also divided the ecliptic, the band of the sky in which the sun, moon, and planets lie, into twelve different sized constellations, which they then abstracted into twelve equally sized signs. Many of their names for these constellations will seem familiar. The Bull of Heaven, the Goatfish, the Great Twins, the Lion, the Crab, the Scorpion. The ancient Greeks called this band the, quote, Circle of Animals, or Cuclos Zodiacon. The Greeks also adopted the Babylonian numerical system, which was based on units of 60 and included a primitive version of the zero. Though the Greeks mistrusted zero so much, they refused to write their calculations in Babylonian, instead reverting to their own cumbersome number system. The 60 base number system is, however, still preserved today, in the division of the sky into 360 units, 60 times 6. And, when the mechanical clock replaced the sky as the primary means to tell the time, the division of its face into 60 units. But the Babylonians would never receive due credit from their Greek inheritors. It would not be until the complete translation and digestion of Babylonian texts in the 20th century that their role in shaping Greek science was finally understood. In the 3rd century BC, Alexander the Great unified Egypt, Greece, Babylon, and Persia into a single Greek culture, easing the transfer of knowledge between these regions. The Greeks and Babylonians' attitudes to science complemented each other. The Babylonians made strenuous, meticulous observations, but failed to assemble them into an underlying theory, while the Greeks were giddy about constructing underlying theories, but preferred to rely on others for observational data. Greek astronomers in the 2nd century AD claimed to possess unbroken records back to 747 BC, the time of the Babylonian king Nabonassar. But Alexander's empire could not survive his death, and in 146 BC, the Greeks were swallowed by the Roman Empire, and their astronomy, and their exotic word planet, became part of Roman, and later European, culture. No one better represented this new Romano-Greek world than Claudius Ptolemaeus, or Ptolemy. A Greek-speaking Egyptian, he was nevertheless a Roman citizen, while very little is known about his background, the text he left behind, the Almagest, is the single greatest source of astronomical knowledge left to us from the ancient world. The standard model of the ancient Greek universe was explained by Aristotle in his book On the Heavens, written in 350 BC. The Earth was a sphere, set still and motionless in the center of the cosmos, a Greek word meaning both order and beauty. Around the Earth were a series of utterly invisible rotating spheres into which the Sun, Moon, and five planets were set. These spheres moved in perfect circles around the Earth, their motions eternal and unchanging. Beyond the final sphere, the celestial sphere of the fixed stars, the prime mover, the first cause, kept the universe in motion, but was never moved itself. 
But this delightful clockwork universe was confounded by observations. Rather than simple, perfect circles, the celestial lights at times seemed to ricochet every which way. The sun moved around the Earth once a day, but also performed a corkscrew motion through the sky once a year. Many of the planets occasionally did loop-de-loops and seemed to move backwards. These were certainly not the perfect circular motions envisioned by Aristotle. Ptolemy altered the standard conception in two key ways. First, while Earth was the center of the universe, it needn't be at the exact center of any one sphere. So Ptolemy introduced a small offset to the Earth's position, called the equant, relative to the motion of each sphere. Second, he introduced a sphere on a sphere, called an epicycle, that rode along the larger circle, called a deferent, and moved at its own speed in its own direction. These two simple modifications were able to account for nearly every motion of the sun, moon, stars, and planets visible to the naked eye. So accurate was Ptolemy's model, in fact, that even today planetarium projectors use systems of gears mimicking it to depict planetary motion. Not only did Ptolemy's work supersede all that came before it, it would become the standard astronomical text in the Western world until the invention of the telescope 1,500 years later. But while the Roman Empire brought Greek astronomy to the world, it also muddled it in a few crucial ways, most notably by changing the definition of the word planet for the first time. Until the Roman conquest, the Greek concept of asteris planetae was fairly simple. Some stars moved, most did not. The five that did were Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. The sun and the moon, though they did move, were not considered planets because they were not star-like. However, the Romans seem to have flubbed the translation because their works invariably included the sun and moon as planets. The Greeks held out for as long as they could. Certainly Ptolemy excluded the sun and moon from planethood, but it was this Roman conception that would ultimately win the day, or in its case, days, since the sun and moon joined the five planets in the seven-day week. And for a millennium, that was essentially that. Ptolemy had accounted for the planets and their motions, and there was little that could be said to challenge him. But eventually, things would begin to stir. In the 17th century, a series of discoveries would throw open every question we had thought settled and pave the way to the discovery of the most elusive, most controversial, and most dangerous planet of all. But that is another story for another time. No son de Sfeno, me de no lo sulupo, rosoli honesti posen, totelo so chrono sapeti. No son de Sfeno, me de no lo sulupo. Rosoli honesti tozen, totelo so chronos apetit.